Well, good morning, folks. We're so glad that you could join us here on this wonderful Good Friday, the day that we remember that Christ went to the cross for our sins. And quite honestly, at this point in time, it would have been exactly when Christ would have been on the cross. So we want to we wanna take some time together as families. We want to gather together around the Lord's table. We want to focus on, on how Jesus has been effective in our lives We've got a number of different things that we're going to be doing here this morning. We're going to start off with uh, with Pat joining us this morning. And Pat, you look very springish. I I like that hat. It looks well, very nice. Thank you. Social distancing. Social distancing. Pastor. I apologize. Thank on you. That. You know, I was feeling very nostalgic this morning, and I was remembering. Do you remember when we used to get up really early? and go to a sunrise service sunrise service and then sometimes what we did is we go out and do caroling and go from house to house oh to house. well we That's didn't do that right. we would praise and worship and then we'd run back to the church and we had a huge pancake breakfast and they fed you they didn't feed us <laughs> so you were you were fortunate we didn't get the pancakes <laughs> well I just felt like we used to dress up and we'd wear our Easter bonnets mm -hmm. and so But you know, that's quite the bonnet you're wearing there, Pat. You like it? I, I do, actually. You know, you know, actually, this is my gardening hat. Oh. I don't have an Easter bonnet. Oh. I was thinking of Pereza. You know, if it hadn't been for the fact that I can't get to her, I would, would have borrowed one of her hats. But I glued some flowers on. It's okay it, for it's an Easter, mighty fine. Easter bonnet, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. So, I'm glad you brought it. You know what? I'm glad you brought the presence of the Lord as well. Pat's going to lead us in prayer here this morning. Would Thank you do you. so? Thank you. <clears throat> Let's pray. <clears throat> so, Father, we do remember. We remember the significance of this day 2,000 years ago. We remember that today you suffered on a cruel cross. Lord, I'm thinking of the words of that song, you paid a debt you did not owe. I owe a debt I cannot pay. I needed someone to take my sin away. So Lord, as we celebrate Easter, we remember your death on the cross that paid that debt for us. You set us free from the penalty of sin. And Lord, we're just so grateful. Our hearts just want to burst forth. Thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us. And we say with the psalmist, I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt your name. And so Lord, we do exalt you above all others. We magnify your name. We rejoice over you. We give thanks. We give honor to you today. We raise a hallelujah. We shout hallelujah. Our sins have been washed away. Lord, we have not forgotten. We remember and we are thankful. So bless our time together this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello, everyone. Hello, kids. It's not Pastor Nick at night, but right now it's Pastor Nicole's time to do a little bit of an object lesson. I wanted to do an object lesson with you because I wanted to remember what Good Friday was all about, and I want you to remember it as well. See, this cross, not this one, but it was one like that where Jesus hung and bled and died, and he had nails that were put in his hands and his feet. And that's something that I want to remember today. I got this object lesson off the internet, and the site is called oamanda.com. And today's activity is about the sense of touch and the cross. So I want you to read your children um, about the story of Jesus' death and resurrection. And I want you to ask them a few questions. First of all, ask them, why did Jesus die? Like, why was he nailed to the cross? Because it wasn't just because of the Roman soldiers or the chief priests. Why? It wasn't just the nails that kept him there. It was love. Jesus was nailed to the cross because he loves you and he loves me. And he gave up his life on the cross 
for you and me and to have that relationship. He loves you. And to remind you of this, this is the one time parents that I will say, get a red marker and put your child's hand out like this. And in the middle, and although we know that probably when Jesus was nailed to the cross, it was probably over here. But for now, because we do Jesus like this in sign language, let's take our red marker and make a big red circle. Once we've done that, I want you to tell them that this is going to symbolize the nail mark from Jesus' hand. And then I want you to take a, a Sharpie or a different color of marker and I want you to write their name on it. Now, I'm gonna write my name on here. My name is Nicole and I'm gonna put it beside this red dot. What does that remind me, you of? Well, it reminds Nicole, me, that Jesus died for me and that he loves me very much. And you know what? Later in the day, it might start to come off a little bit, but it's a, it's a reminder for that whole day and maybe even a couple days. That's what Jesus did for me. He had a big owie. He got hurt really bad. But who did he do this for? He did it for me. And that's really what, what we want them to know and understand, that he did it for you and me out of love. I'm gonna ask Michelle to come. Good morning, church. I'll be reading from 1 Peter 1, verse 17 to 19. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. I will also read from second from first peter um, chapter 2 verse 1 therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit hypocrisy envy and slander of every kind like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the lord is good as you come to him the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also live like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Pastor Les will come now and give us the word. Thank you very much, Michelle, and thank you for joining us today. I do consider it a privilege to be able to share God's Word on Good Friday, which is a very special day for those of us who believe. Man is a merchant. He loves to make a deal. The crowd are on the edge of their seat. Is it door number one 
or door number two, or maybe it's door number three that holds the grand prize. Will the young couple surrender that little box they're holding in their hand and risk losing everything in order to win the grand prize? It's the drama like this that has made Let's Make a Deal a favorite TV program for, for many years. Man is a merchant. He loves to make a deal. There's another television program on now. I don't know if Let's Make a Deal is still going or not, but it's this new program is called American Pickers. And these fellows go out to some farmhouse and they look in the barn and they find something that's worth, well, it's worth a lot of money, but they offer to pay it pay a hundred dollars for it and they hope maybe they can sell it for three hundred dollars because man loves to make a deal. When we went to the country of Thailand as missionaries, the first words we had to learn were sawati krap, which means hello. But very soon in our vocabulary we added these words, lot dai mai, which means can you reduce the price? Because man loves to make a deal. I remember going to the market on one occasion and there was a man bartering with the lady merchant. And uh, when I went into the market, they were maybe about $2 apart on their price. I came back about 20 minutes later and they were still debating the price and I think they had it down to about $1 difference at that time. You see, man is a merchant who loves to speculate, loves to negotiate because we all love a bargain. Let it be announced that it's Bay Day or Black Friday and we will play chicken with the other drivers in the parking lot. We will elbow one another around the merchant table. We will jostle in the aisles. We will maul the merchandise and then we'll stand for, in line for half an hour at the teller because we're going to make a deal. That item was priced at $49, but we got it for $19. What a deal, we saved 30 whole dollars. Well, I'm not just sure how we actually can save money by spending it, but that seems to be the logic. We are merchants, Jesus said so. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, he, reads, he says these words, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that is hid in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his great joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away and he sold everything he had and he bought that pearl. People today in our world are looking for fine pearls. Some are looking for the pearl of fame or maybe fortune. Some are looking for a pearl of gold or glory. Others are seeking the fine pearl, at least they, in their estimation, believe it would be a fine pearl of honor or health or, or happiness. But then Jesus goes on in this parable and says, when this farmer or when this merchant found something of great value, they sold everything they had in order to purchase it. There are some things in life that we just feel like we we really just have to have. Some of the Bible commentators suggest that that pearl of great price was the church. Now it is true that God loves his church and he did pay a great price to purchase us. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we find that Christ himself is a pearl of great price. If you know Jesus as your forgiver and your leader, your Lord, then I don't have to tell you that it's worth putting everything else aside in order to win Christ into our lives. The person who lets everything go in order to win Christ has made a great deal. The apostle Paul thought so because in Philippians chapter three, he says, oh, I considered everything that I had as a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ my Lord. Paul gave up everything, and he had quite a bit actually to give up, but he thought it was worth it in order to know Christ. 
Once in a while in our life, we will come across something that we esteem to be of great value. That's something that's special and something that's very precious. Some things are precious because they are beautiful. People will pay a very high price for an article that they deem to be an item of exquisite beauty. I might just add that my wife has all of these fine qualities and that's why she is precious. People will pay a very high price for a Picasso painting. A man once said, I wish I had enough money to buy a Picasso painting. His friend said to him, I didn't know you even liked Picasso's painting. And the man said, well, I don't like Picasso's painting. I just wish I had enough money to buy one of Picasso's paintings. Well, if you're a lover of modern art, I think I have to apologize. There are some pieces of modern art that I just don't comprehend. I guess my sense of value just somehow isn't there. I confess, I don't understand why they are worth as much as they are asking. But let me add quickly that there are some pieces of art that are beautiful, and I can admire the craftsmanship and the skill of those who take that image and put it down on canvas. I might just add that God is a pretty good artist himself. Who could surpass the glory and the beauty of some of God's sunsets? Some things are precious because they're beautiful. Some things are precious because they're rare. Do you happen to have a 1933 Gold Eagle gold coin? It was worth $20 at the time. But in the year 2002, that coin sold for $7.59 million. That's because there's only two of them in the whole world. Avid stamp collectors know that they will pay a high price for a very rare and unusual stamp. You see, rubies would be cheap if they were as common as gravel on the road. So some things are valued because they are rare. Remember that piece of junk that you threw out a few years ago? Well, now it's an antique. Now it's worth a lot of money and you wish that you had kept it. Some things are valuable because they are useful. You ladies may have a gadget in the kitchen that uh, you just love it because it's so helpful and useful in so many different ways. And some of you men, you have a tool in your garage. You only paid $9 for it, but today you wouldn't give it up for anything because it is so helpful to you. It has great utilitarian value. I heard a story about a man that was lost in the desert. When he came across a, a chest that somebody had abandoned, he rushed towards it in eager anticipation and opened it up only to find that it was full of nothing more than useful diamonds. He needed water. He didn't need diamonds. Things are valuable because they are useful. And then we cherish some things because they have personal significance for us. It might be a gift from a grandmother or relative. It might be some special piece of jewelry, something that we treasure because of the emotional attachment that comes with it. You see, if a house burns down, the furniture can be replaced. But some of these heirlooms, some of these personal items are gone forever. And those are the things that we would greatly grieve about. Then there are some things that are precious to us because they're loved and adored. Our kids, for example, well, sometimes we give them away for a dime. Sometimes we might even pay somebody to take them away for us. But the truth is, we wouldn't sell them for a million dollars. Well, you still have Nobody actually ever offered me a million dollars. But, but the reality is they are precious to us because we love them and care for them. Some things are valu valuable not because they ring value in our wallet, but because they have an emotional tug upon our hearts. One thing is certain. When we know what a person values, what they deem to be precious, 
it gives us a little bit of insight into who that person really is. The things that we value are the things that give our life purpose and meaning. The people that we meet, the experiences that we enjoy, and the memories that we cherish. These are the things that make our life worthwhile. These are the things that give our life value. Favorite places, special people, precious memories from the past. These are the treasures of a lifetime. These are the things that last. So pity the poor person who has nothing in life that they deem as special or precious to them. That individual has already lost some of the joy of life. They have ceased to live life in its fullness and abundance. So I hope that you hold some very fond memories from the past. I hope you have some very dear friends in the present. And I hope that you have great anticipation for some bright hopes in the future. Because if we know what a person really likes and really values, it gives us a little insight into the character of that person. Now for a person who is a follower of Jesus, there's nothing more precious than the kingdom of God. And in the whole kingdom of God, there's nothing more precious than Jesus. And in the whole life of Jesus, there's nothing more precious than the cross. Whenever we approach that hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull, we realize that we are standing on holy ground. Any consideration of the cross of Calvary is a sacred adventure. And although it may be impossible for us with our limited mortal minds to fully comprehend the significance and the meaning and the value of the cross, we can still say without hesitation, without equivocation or without controversy that the cross of Jesus Christ is very, very precious. Now, it's interesting, is it not, that this tool of torture, this instrument of death, would actually become something that we hold as precious. It is precious to us because in the first place, it is a place where a precious price was paid. We cannot fully understand or appreciate the cross until we understand who it was that gave his life on that cross. Jesus was heaven's greatest treasure. He was God's unspeakable gift. He was adored by the angels. He was worshiped by the seraphims. He was loved by his heavenly father. He was the light and the glory of eternity, the cherished object of heaven's greatest praise. He was precious to the host of heaven and he was dear to his heavenly father. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, the verse that Michelle read a minute ago says, He was rejected by men, but he was chosen by God and precious to him. Now, I kind of think that Jesus had it pretty good in heaven, but he chose to leave the splendor and the glory and come into this world of darkness because we needed the light. The message translation of the Bible says in John chapter one, Jesus moved onto our street because we were in trouble. We needed his help. Sin had marred our world. Sin had perverted the plan and the purposes of God. Sin had scarred our personal lives. We needed a savior. We needed a redeemer who could buy us back to God, a ransom who could pay the price for our salvation. And so Jesus came into this world and he became a precious cornerstone. He became the foundation of our faith. In 1 Peter, it says Jesus was precious to God. But just two verses later, chapter two, verse six, it says, as Peter quotes from Isaiah the prophet, says, see, I lay in Zion a chosen and a precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will not be put to shame. The message translation says, if you do that, you will never regret it. Another commentator says, if you do that, you will never be disappointed. Jesus was and is precious to God. 
But because he came to this planet and because he died on the cross, he has become precious to us. And therefore we esteem him this morning because he is precious because he left heaven so we could go there. The cross is precious because Jesus, God's only begotten son, the perfect, holy, spotless son of God, gave his life as a sacrifice for us. He was preciousness personified and the cross is precious because he died so we can live. The apostle Peter preaching in Acts chapter three makes, these interest, makes this interesting observation, it says, you killed the Prince of Peace. Think of it, the one who gives us life was killed by us, but he did it for us. A few years ago, we were at History Makers, our youth convention, and they were selling t-shirts. I loved what was written on them. It says, he, they nailed his hands to a piece of wood, but he made the hill on which it stood. You and I could stand on the great battlefields of this world, and we could be emotionally moved with the realization that there were people who paid the ultimate price for our freedom. But none of those battlegrounds compared to what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross of Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. He gave his life to forgive us for our sins and deliver us from the dominion of darkness. That's why we believe the cross is precious. We also believe the cross is precious because it is where God's amazing love was proved. Now we need to understand that the cross primarily was not to prove anything, but to provide something. It provides our salvation. But having said that, it also proves the amazing love of God. Jesus says, greater love than this has no person that they would be willing to lay down their life for a friend. When Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus and called Lazarus out from the dead, the people said, how he loved Lazarus. But when we look at the cross, we have to say how he has loved us. He loved you and me. Jesus said in John chapter 15, greater love than this has no person that they would lay down their life for a friend, but he didn't just say it. He also demonstrated it by his action on the cross. And that's why we say with confidence the words that are recorded in Romans chapter eight, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or trouble or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors because nothing can separate us from the amazing love of God. Then we find the cross to be precious because that's where the precious blood of Jesus was poured out. Now, some of you know I am not a great lover of blood. Well, actually, I, I do like blood in its rightful place, which is flowing nicely through my veins. But uh, when we were in our first church pastoring, uh, they had a blood donor clinic and being the good citizen that I am, uh, I went to donate blood. Now it really was, you need to understand, it really was a very bad setup. Because when you were waiting to make your donation, you were able to look at all these other people stretched out there on the cots, and there the blood going like that. They said, would you like to have a Coke and a cookie? I said, I really would. And so they came back a little bit later and they said, you're looking kind of ashen. You're looking a little pale. Uh, would you like another Coke and a cookie? And I said, yeah, I think I would. And then I was feeling kind of uh, woozy. And so I decided that I would go and take a walk around the block. When I came back out of the fresh air, I was feeling great. Pat was already up on the cot there. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And uh, they said, okay, Pastor Markham, now you can come. And I got up to do my duty. And then, oh, sweet relief. I felt great. When I came to, I was looking up at all these faces looking in at me and, are you all right? Are you all right? I said, I feel great. Put me up on the cot. They said, no, you're a reject. 
So you can tell my feeling about blood. But I also hear the demand of scripture in the book of Hebrews chapter nine, where it says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. And blood represents our life because our life is in the blood. But the blood of sinful man was tainted by its sin. So it could not cleanse us from our sinfulness. You see, you can't, clean, can't wipe a window clean with a dirty cloth. You can't make your, dry yourself dry with a wet towel. And we need it clean blood, pure blood, the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from our sin. And so 1 Peter in chapter one, as Michelle read, says we were not redeemed with silver or gold, but we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. We know that when Jesus was on the cross, a soldier took his spear and pierced the side of Jesus. And it says in John chapter 19, out came a flow of blood and water. That blood of Jesus was a cleansing stream. And we can say with the songwriter, the cleansing stream I see, I see. And oh, that blood cleanses me. First John chapter one, verse seven says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. I really like that all sin part. Big sin, little sin, black sin, white sin, if there is such a thing. All sin is cleansed by the blood of Jesus. The songwriter said, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. When D.L. Moody was preaching in Europe on one occasion, uh, a lady came up to him and said, Mr. Moody, I like your preaching, but I don't like your approach to the cross. And he, she, he said, well, uh, what is it about the approach to the cross you don't like? She said, I don't like the fact that you talk about the blood of Jesus. And D.L. Moody, the evangelist, said to her, ma'am, I'm afraid you don't understand. The blood of Jesus is not my approach to the cross. The blood of Jesus is my message of the cross. When the blood of Jesus is applied to our lives, the gates of oppression will fall off their hinges. The walls of condemnation will fall flatter than the walls of Jericho and the forces of evil will be forced to flee because there's power in the blood of Jesus. In Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul preaching says, and God has purchased the church with his own precious blood. Then we think the cross of Jesus is precious was provided. You see, between us and God, there was this great chasm, kind of like the Grand Canyon. And men said, if you try and work hard, maybe you can build a bridge across the gap. But God said, I won't wait for you to come to my side. I'm gonna to come to your side. And although we didn't earn it and we don't deserve it, God came to earth. He built a bridge that spans the gulf by his amazing grace. The songwriter said, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan and oh, the grace that brought it down to man. God's unmerited favor has been extended to us through the cross. You and I can never work our way into heaven. We can never be good enough to fulfill all of God's demands or commands, but God became flesh. He moved onto our street so that we could be accepted through the Son, Jesus Christ. God's grace is sufficient. It's capable of meeting every need. God's grace is sublime. It's wonderful to experience. God's grace is super abundant. It's not just enough, it is more than enough. So today, my friend, if you have any sense of hardness of heart or any inclination to stay away from God or any bitterness of spirit or loss of spiritual appetite. I encourage you to realize with me again, the preciousness of the cross of Jesus. It's the place where a precious price was paid. It's the place where his precious love was proved. It's the place where his blood was poured out. And it's the place where his precious grace was provided. You see, man is a merchant. He loves to make a deal. And boy, do I have a deal for you. If you will turn in your own life of sin and selfishness and accept his gift of salvation, 
you can take off your old tattered garments and he will put on you his robe of pure white. We stand not in our righteousness, but in his righteousness because of what Christ has done for us. Jim Elliott, a missionary who was actually martyred in South America said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. On this Palm, on this Good Friday, we want to join the crowd that says, thank you, Lord, for the precious cross. Glory to God in the highest. You have made provision for us. The cross of Jesus is beautiful, not physically beautiful, but spiritually beautiful. It is rare. There was only one Jesus and only one way to God. It was useful because it washed away our sins and it gave us a new life and new hope in Christ. And it's something that we cherish and love because we love him because he first loved us. Thank God for the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we like to make good deals but whenever there's a deal, oftentimes somebody has to pay. And we're glad that you were willing to pay the price so that we could receive the benefits. And now, Lord, we have the benefit of your blessing and we have the blessing of your benefits in our lives. And so, Lord, once again on this Good Friday, we pause to say thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you, Father God, for sending your only begotten Son into this world to die for us so that we might live with him and for him. We ask it in your name, amen. Pastor Wes is gonna come back at this time and we're gonna share with you a time of communion around the table of the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Les. How important it is that we understand, first of all, how precious the cross is. But realistically, folks, it boils on down to how precious we actually are in the sight of God. He, as Pastor Les said, God made a way for us to have a relationship with Him once again because He loves you, because He loves us. And you know, today we are, are remembering Good Friday, as we call it, but literally hours before that day, that incident where Jesus was put on a cross, he sat with his closest friends, the ones he considered to be incredibly precious to him. And, and he said to them, I, I so long to have this meal with you. They didn't understand it would be the last one that he would have in, in this way. And he, uh, he, he called them to himself and he says, I want you to understand, he said during the meal, that, that something's going to happen in a couple of hours. Basically, he says, I am going to be broken before you. And it says that he took a piece of bread and he broke it. And, and again, they didn't understand the meaning of that. But he broke it in their presence. They said, listen, that's what my body is going to be like in just a few hours. He, he took a, a cup and he said, as you drink this cup, I, remember, as Pastor Les just said, remember, my blood will be spilt for you. So folks, I'm going to ask you in, in these moments, if you, if you can go to your kitchen, if you can gather your family around, if you can go grab a, a piece of bread, grab some juice, sit with your kids for just a minute. And I want you to remember what Jesus did for us. So we're just going to take a minute and, and allow you to do that as, as Steve plays here for about a minute. And then we're going to call you back in just a second. tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as I said, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, take eat, this is my body that is broken for you. And Father, as we are in your presence today, 
wherever we find ourselves, in our different homes, in our different places. Lord, we know your presence is there right now. And Lord, we join with people around the world today as they remember the day that Jesus gave it all so that we could have a relationship with you. We thank you for the body that was broken for us. We thank you, Lord, for this, this emblem that symbolizes his broken body. And Lord, I pray now in Jesus' name, as we take this together, and as we remember, Father, that you would be glorified in and through our lives in Jesus' name. Scripture says that in the same way after supper, he also took the cup. And as we mentioned already, the preciousness of the blood of Jesus. I'm going to distribute that and we're going to take it together here this morning. Can I encourage you where you're at right now? to take that piece of bread. Can I encourage you to hold it in your hand for just a minute? And just for just a minute, remember the incredible sacrifice that Jesus made for you and for me. Again, Father, thank you. Thank you for the body of Jesus that was broken. We partake of this together in your name. And if I can encourage you as a family to take that cup, can I encourage you to, uh, to look at it together? It's just, a, it's just juice, but it symbolizes the incredible sacrifice Jesus made. So Father, thank you. You tell us in your word, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. So Lord, as we partake of this cup together, I pray that we would remember that you have made a way for us to have a relationship with you and we would enjoy that together as a family, Lord, the relationship with you both now and into eternity. Let's partake together. Amen. We want to thank you for being part of our service here this morning. We want to encourage you to... Uh, to join us again Sunday morning at 11 o'clock for Resurrection Sunday as we remember the, we remember the death, but we, we are so glad that Sunday is coming and that we can rejoice together. So please join us. Please take time, even this afternoon as you're together with the family. Don't lose sight of the importance of this day. We pray God's blessing on you. We pray that God would protect you and keep you. We pray that in the midst of all that you're seeing around us, don't lose sight. There is hope. Folks, we will get through this. Together we will get through this. We will be rejoicing together soon in, in this place where we are at right now. But most importantly, someday together to rejoice in God's presence. God bless you. We wish you all the best. Amen.